to the club. Okay. Good thing you're not, pre Tom, good thing you're not president. <laughs> good thing I'm not president. Although, although presidents have hadn't had such good luck with recording. <laughs> not not a good call. Not some of them, that's for sure. That, 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 that is true. And, uh, and so, Frank, Frank, did you pass your COVID test so you could get these procedures started on your prostate? Yeah, I got, uh, yeah, I did. I, I'm finished with the procedures. It was the se Monday the 7th and Monday the 14th. So. And, but and, was, what is the, and what do they do to you? What is the you know, procedure? I go on, like this, this time I was under for three hours. And they go in with a probe into the prostate and they deposit radiation on the prostate and then intensify it onto the lesions in the prostate. In my case, everything's confined. There's no nothing escape. So it's a three hour procedure. You're under, it, you're recovering almost, the most of the recovery is from the anesthesia. You know, you're not, mm -hmm. takes, days to get free of that you know right did they did they tell you you'll be glowing in the dark oh, there you go. <laughs> or cer certain parts of you will be glowing in the dark <laughs> no, they yeah. didn't, no, because... <laughs> turn out the lights and shake <laughs> actually it's quite the opposite <laughs> it's bruising in the dark <laughs> yeah for sure and then also you have to be careful handling picking up and uh, baptizing babies and things like that yeah well i've been pretty you know uh, you know the pastor where i help out called and said that he had a visiting priest this week so to take the weekend off so no, i think that's probably a smart idea yeah, so I, i've got a funeral awake on sunday and a funeral on monday here in town it's a, a dear friend so i might have to do that but anyway i'm okay yeah does it hurt frank no, um, it, it burned for quite a while afterwards, oh. but there's a medicine for that and it kind of goes away. So I figure, I figure it's a small price for my sins. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was a lady, in, there was an eccentric lady in Boston many years ago. She has a museum, actually beautiful museum named after her, named Isabella Stewart Gardner. Oh yes. I've been and there, on, I've been there, I've been yeah, there. Yeah, and on, on Ash Wednesday, she was seen, she was very eccentric. Um, she was seen out um, washing the steps of the Church of the Advent. And someone said to her, why are you doing that? She said, well, it's Lent and this is for my sins. And some wag walking by said, for her sins, she'd have to wash the whole church. <laughs> <laughs> so you believe in, uh, in purgatory? Huh? So you believe in Victoria in Yeah, yeah I, 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 I actually do, but I don't, I, I like um, Rollheiser's uh, kind of insight into it, that it's like a blind man. When they wake up, it takes time, when they get their sight back, it takes a lot of time to adjust to the color and the light and all of that. I can and identify with that. Way. Huh? I can identify with that in particular. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah. This this week. But that's Rollheiser's kind of image of purgatory, yeah. which I think is which I think makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I think it's a good a good image. Uh, you know, it, it to, to me it's very you know interesting. We we have no way of expressing those kinds of realities. We have no way. We have no no language to express God's relationship with us. Yeah. Right. Everything is by analogy. Uh, so, you know, one analogy is usually as good as another, and they kind of supplement each other. Right. Yep. Yeah. And different analogies work for different people. That's clear over time. Yeah. I just I just left the the son of the deceased, and he asked to sit with me alone uh, after his sisters had finished and. Um, he, he kind of shared with me, you know, his concern that he was going to express something and he want, but he, you know, the church wasn't high on his dance card, etc. cetera, um, about his mother and about the soul and the spirit, etc. So I said, well, is, <clears throat> what you're going to say, is it respectful of your mother and everyone else who's there? Oh, absolutely. He said, I said, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Good. Good counsel. Interesting to see what you say afterwards. 
Huh? Well, yeah, yeah. no, I'm, I'm confident actually, but <laughs> I, I think, for example, we need on a practical basis to begin to um, um, to assure people that we know are good people that we can't box God. Yeah. Hey, Norm. Hey, Norm, Norm yes, where, are you, where are you sitting right now? In my are office? The rectory? Are you at the huh? rectory? Yeah. Is that good or bad? No, that's good. That was my parish for, for about the first five years after I got married. We lived um, a couple blocks away from St. Matthew's. Oh, okay. Yeah, loved it. Loved it. It's a nice place. There's room for about five priests up here. <laughs> wow. Is there really? I think so. How many, how many, is it just you and the pastor, Norm? Yeah. Yeah. But he's changing rooms because he has a room that's facing the street. There's a lot of noise on the street at yeah, night. So mm -hmm. he's going to take these moving to the room on the side where it's quieter. Yeah. Is that, is that 7th Street or Anaheim? 7th. 7th. Okay. And I was going to ask you this last week. What parish did you grow up in? Were you in St. Barnabas with Gatlin? That's correct. Me and Gatlin, oh. yeah. Okay. Okay. I remember going over to your house well, during high school one time. Yes, you did. Um, and I remember that someone in your family, maybe your dad, was changing a tire and the tire exploded and a piece of shrapnel or something hit them? Or did I make that up? No, no, that happened. Who, who, who did it happen to? Your dad? Yeah, my dad. But he was okay. Yeah, it's just weird what you can remember from yeah, 50, 60 years is. ago. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember where I was That is a Monday. long time ago. But and I remember a mile from us. <laughs> and Norm St. Barnabas was a very dominant elementary school in sports. <clears throat> oh yeah, we'd be there. Baseball, else. basketball, football, all three. Yep. I remember yep. when we were playing uh, Catholic Little League and I was playing for St. Athanasius is we, I don't know where we went to play. You know, we were playing St. Barnabas. And our coach said, oh, there's this guy out playing shortstop. A um, couple guys out in the infield. You got to be careful of one guy. I think Norm was called Tom Tucker. And another, Tucker, guy, yes. Great athlete. Another, guy, another guy was called Barney Gatlin. And he said, this Gatlin guy is really a good ball player. And he was. it was just, oh, yeah. just, just kind of magical when we showed up at the seminary together and Norm, did you did you take the the red the streetcar home with us yes you did yes. yeah taxi you bus, i Grammer, and barney and uh al Tommy. and danny robitaille who was a year ahead of us that's right robitaille yes i forgot about him yeah 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 jeez do you realize how long ago that was? <laughs> it's funny that I remember so much of that, but not yesterday. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. I think that's maybe a pleasure of aging. Now, you guys who are just coming on to being 80 this week, I think there are some pleasures in becoming a really old fart. <laughs> the rest of us have been. And that is how important your memories, your memories are of your younger years. And it's not that those memories are accurate. I mean, it, you know, it may not be that they're accurate, but over time, at least my, my memories of you guys and we were in seminary together, I, I, my memory is of pleasant kinds of things, you know, oh, not, awesome not bullshit stuff or anything like that, but, and so um, I'll share with you, a memory of Shavira is, I think, I don't know if it was freshman year or sophomore year in the dorm. Ned, I think your bed was at the far end of the dorm. And 
when the lights would go out, you'd get down and do your push-ups. <laughs> and we could hear you <laughs> grunting. <laughs> we could we could hear Ned grunting and groaning, you know. And then there was another guy whose bed <clears throat> say his name was McDaniel. But maybe but anyway, he he was afraid to ever take a shower. Oh my. So he 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 developed a really body stench and no matter imagine. how often no matter how often he changed his clothes now maybe <laughs> wrong on the name but i'm not wrong on the kid because he didn't last even <clears throat> first year but he had this paralysis about going into the communal showers with us for frank and bob um those dormitories were 20 weren't they yeah. 10 on, yeah. on each side yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. How how old were you at the time? 13, 14. We were ninth graders. Putting 20 young teenagers into uh, a room overnight. Eating. We had fun. We had a lot of fun. We did have fun. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 we had a dormitorian. Is that the right word, guys? Yes, yeah, dormitorian. We drove That's them crazy. And, and he was his name was Wiley Barnett, I think. The, the yeah. dorm I was in, and he was he was a black guy. Yep. And and quite honestly, to show you how segregated life was where I lived, he was the first black guy that I ever got to know, and I thought he was wonderful. Um, I, I don't so have. Too. Yeah. Do we? Did he go on to be ordained, Johnny? No, I don't think so. No, oh, it was a great guy, though. I mean, you know, you're right. Imagine, imagine. So he was a freshman in college, and he had <clears> 20, <throat> 20 ninth graders who had never probably been away from home except the Boy Scout camp or something like that. It yeah. must have been a real, real interesting job to have, you know. Look, at, at the risk of, uh, of messing with lots of happy memories, I, I'm wondering if it might shift conversation just a little bit to things that have been happening this week They're probably of not terribly significant import on the other hand probably worth chatting about a little bit and this there's been some meeting going on in dc of the guys who wear these uh, red hats I, I, mean, I, I, I think they're in baltimore they're in baltimore i think aren't they yeah mm -hmm. Uh, somewhere, make any somewhere in the DC, yeah, yeah. somewhere in, somewhere in the area, at any rate, and uh, I was curious about what their agenda looked like. So I, I took a look at it, and hoping and praying before I looked at it that there might be some reference to uh, concern for the planet, uh, <clears throat> temperatures going up, glaciers melting, something that felt that might reflect a, a little bit like Francis's Laudato Si, some concern for the planet. And I, I looked at it in pretty good detail and I could find nothing. Uh, that was the present guys in charge, that's for sure. I could find nothing. And, and, and a, another thing that was of, uh, that was like, the image that came to me was like, oh my God, they're all on the, on the Titanic. They don't know it, and they're concerned with the colors of the deck chairs. Oh, and uh, you, you know, know that, I uh, think the uh, National Catholic uh, Reporter uh, said that they 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 decided to take up um, uh, global warming. Oh, did they? Did, did I did I read it wrongly, Tom? Have you well, seen that? I, I don't. That may that may well be because uh, the agenda, of course, available to me is the public agenda. Yeah. The first two first two days, three days, and then uh, the third or fourth day is all private sessions. So it may have come up there, but there's no nothing in the in, which is too bad to at least mention the possibility for people like me who are the critical kind of looking to see how relevant is this to what what we might be concerned about as they say in the old days and today's those of sitting in the pews and how relevant etc so 
um, maybe in the in in in, in the in the, in the private one. And the other concern that I had too, uh, reflecting conversation from the NCR at Crooks and a few other places was who they elected as, uh, as president um, of, of, uh, of the conference. And uh, I really don't know a whole lot about him other, other than uh, over the years, he has a reputation for not exactly being a uh, friend, what quote a Francis Bishop. I think it was John Allen who said that he has a unique talent of explaining Pope Francis that ends up saying he was wrong. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, hey Bob, and, I, I was I was wrong. It's uh, it's the Vatican is looking to to address uh, addressing climate climate change. Yeah, yeah. I, I had seen I had seen that little uh, that little blurb that little piece uh, too, Ned. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. that, it was, that it was coming it was coming from uh, the Vatican. Uh, yeah. So wielding new status in the United Nations climate talks. Don't don't know what that means, but we'll see. Yes. Uh huh. You know, I'm looking at the U.S. Bishop's uh, website, and they do have a department uh, on environmental justice. And um, Archbishop Coakley is the chair of it, and they did do a, on the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si, they had, uh, had, had a statement on the care of our common home. And... Um, I guess September 1st this year was uh, World Day of Prayer and Care for Creation, and they, you know, they did make a statement on it. But, you know, my humble estimation is the, the best way to hide a secret is for the bishops to make a statement on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of Tom, or any of you, uh, ha has there been... Uh, uh, an evaluation of the performance of Archbishop Gomez in his position. He's the past it. president, right? Who would make that evaluation? I'm yeah. tempted, <laughs> tempted to say who? And who, who would I call it a performance? Who? Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, who's the NPR or, or uh, who knows? A performance, yeah. <laughs> No, I don't think so, Johnny. I no. I, I mean, you know, there's things that have been written about it, and um, but and people have been kind. I think you know, um, not not just saying blah. Yeah, saying blah. Yeah, he's pretty blah, and I think that's what they like. Not real dynamic, huh? Mm -hmm. No, but I mean, not 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 moving anywhere you know uh, exactly. I, I, i've read several places that that uh having picked the military um uh, bishop that's really just a, a very direct uh way of telling francis that um uh, that they're not in accord <clears throat> is that do you guys think that um yes i do Francis is an enigma to me. I, I really love that guy. I, I remember reading the first book that I could find by Austin Ivory, and I thought it was wonderful. Um, sometimes he, he does, you know, quirky things that, it, that uh, you know, wonder what's that all about? Anyway. Well, oh, it, you know, it's, it's kind of... Uh, unusual for us to think of the Pope as a human being. Yeah. And um, I think Francis shows both sides of his humanity, the deep side of his humanity and the flawed side of his humanity. Yeah. But that's that's how we all are and that's how we're all saved. Yeah. yeah. Ned, was it in that book that um, he stressed how Francis was so arrogant as the provincial of the Jesuits that they fired him, right? Yeah, they, that, that did happen, but uh, Ivory never says that he believes that Francis was arrogant. Right. 
but certainly a whole bunch of people around him did. Uh, uh -huh. and, and he winds up in Germany somewhere, I believe, uh, yes. where he finds the uh, uh, untire, Mary the untire of knots. Mary undoer of knots. And, yep. and, and, uh, and he, he's just, he just can't stay there. He, he can't do this charade of picking up a, a, a doctorate and, and just returns to uh, Argentina. And uh, not so slowly, but but not quickly, uh, uh, became close to to the Cardinal Archbishop of uh, of Buenos Aires. Not Buenos you, Aires. You, you you think about the differences, you know, because there's been a lot in the press about you know, the uncovering of more and more information on how the Vatican was during World War II, particularly Pius XII. Yeah. is that, you know, Francis, Benedict, and John Paul II were probably the most media, the media probably spent more time focused on them than any other pope that I can remember. And there were more sources of information. You know, there were more glimpses into them as Frank says, their human, their human nature. And, um, you know, you, what is Francis, 85? You know, and we're talking at the beginning of our session about Biden being 80. I, I would think it would be a monumentally difficult position to be in, to be 85 or in his middle 80s, the way Francis is, not in great health and still trying to navigate through all of the controversies that you put on your desk. I, I think it would be, yeah. geez, just just you know a, a, an impossible task to and maintaining a, and maintaining a superhuman travel schedule yeah That's yeah right. yeah he's an amazing guy he, there was a, a report uh, uh recently also that said uh saint or <laughs> saint that uh, pope francis said you know i'm i'm in pain it hurts it really hurts and uh uh, but he just kept on soldiering, on, you know. Uh, I, he, he's a wonderful man. I just the, but the bishops of the United States, I think, you know, there's there's no imagination. I think I don't know. <laughs> there is, but it's not. They're not. There are some really good bishops, I think, but they're not in positions of authority or power. Right. Right. Even if a couple of them are cardinals. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, uh, there was a, a picture of uh, um, oh, your, your Cardinal Archbishop, Frank. Um, O'Malley. O'Malley, yeah, leading a, a parade uh, or, or a, a procession um, uh, around Boston. <clears throat> he apparently is one of Francis's favorite American cardinals would you would you agree with that? Yeah, very much so. I think what happened when Francis got elected, um, Cardinal Dolan was just finishing his term as president of the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. And up until that time, he'd kind of been the high profile bishop in the US. Mm -hmm. um, but O'Malley was chosen to be on one of the nine cardinals in the kitchen cabinet, whatever you call it, that advises the Pope. And that that and his loss of the the presidency or you know, just finishing his term, put uh, Dolan on the back burner and kind of brought O'Malley to the front. But O'Malley's not the kind of operator who would, you know, thump his chest at being at the front. He what you see is what you get. He is a very spiritual profoundly humble, extraordinarily intelligent man. Mm -hmm. And I think for those reasons kind of has, I think he's back in the good graces of, you know, he fell out when he criticized Francis, for what he did in Chile. Mm -hmm. He publicly criticized him. And, um, but I think now he's kind of back, but he's, you know, uh, Sean O'Malley was 78, on the 29th of June. So he's kind of on his way out in Boston. Where he'll go, I don't know. So. Yeah. 
Well, he's and he's a Franciscan, as you know. He's, he, and, yeah. and more than that, more and, than that, he's a he's a Capuchin. He's right. A Capuchin. And, and yeah. he embodies very much the humility, the the tra right. tradition of, of right. Francis. He's a, he's a, in the best sense, I think, mostly earthy. Uh, yeah, he very much. Uh, you know, he's a wonderful, down-to-earth sense of humor. You yeah, know, right. where I lived in South Boston, he would periodically come in for dinner, and it was, it was just another priest from the neighborhood of the next rectory came in for dinner. That's, yeah. And the interesting thing is, he's a classmate of Sha Pu. Wow. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Very opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. They're the same age and everything. And well, now have... when you said that, when you said that he would drop in for dinner, is this when you were back into the priesthood or when you were a married guy? No, no, I, I was living in the rectory at that time. I'd been back in the priesthood. Oh, okay, okay. Did you now, know when him I, before when you... I came back to the priesthood? He communicated with me regularly. I, I saved it. I have a note from him telling me to be patient and hang in there because the Holy Father is supportive and um, uh, and that he thinks this is going to happen. Um, uh, in his own hand and the envelope even addressed in his own hand. Hey, hey Frank, you were always in the priesthood. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were out of, you were not, not a cleric, you were non-canonical. Don't mind me if I sound a little... Uh, and then you became a you were your priesthood was recognized. All I know, of, I know. All of us share that common priesthood A by virtue of baptism yeah, and B yes. by virtue of ordination. Very much so. And I was uh, and yeah, actually I always, you. always always <laughs> aware of that, although I always I agreed to be laicized and followed what they what I agreed to. Yes. You know, but so, you, you cannot. So did you know, I. Yeah, I, I did the same thing, but I always thought that that was just the legal fiction. And, right, uh, it is. I, I went through it because I'm an Eagle Scout and I follow the rules. And, right. Uh, <laughs> Good for you. That. Frank, John, if you don't mind, I don't remember. Have you shared with us who have been your spiritual directors over, let's say, the last... 15 years or so? Well, my main one was my, um, was a seminary director. He was a stigmatine priest <clears throat> when I went back. But I did have some priest friends, but I never kept up really tight because when you leave the ministry, the um, your schedule of your life is different, for example. You know, you're, you're free on the weekend. <laughs> and, <laughs> And you're you're absorbed with you know getting kids here, there, and everywhere, and you also have to figure out um, what your wife thinks about all of this. Or I would I would think that would be a touchy issue. Well, there are uh, it, it it isn't a constantly touchy issue, but you have to be aware of incidents or whatever that might bring that to the fore. Okay. Um, my wife said to me, my wife had been in the convent for about seven years and she left. And um, before, you know, I, I met her or any, she had left. She used to say to me, Frank, the convent was a dreadful fit for me, but the priesthood was a good fit for you. Hmm. You know what? Mary Alice, my wife used to say somewhat, say that somewhat similarly, although yeah. though as a, as a physician, in private practice and a medical school professor, she had her own identity. So that those kind of things, I had my identity, she had her <clears throat> identity. We supported one another, we shared one another. Uh, she would occasionally participate in some of my activities because I stayed active uh, in the non-canonical priesthood through my involvement with Corpus over the years. Uh -huh. with, with your involvement with what, Bob? Corpus. Do, do you know the the Married Priests uh, organization started in the U.S. in the, in the in the mid seventies? Uh, maybe sometime we might want to 
talk about that. Where it, yeah, well, you'll send us all the link to to their to their website. Well, yeah, that yeah, that's right. All that information is yeah. the history and everything. But we're getting ready, getting ready to observe our uh, the Corpus fiftieth anniversary in the hmm. in the states, and it's linked to international groups of married priests around the world as well. So there's an international federation. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of interested in, in in that, you know, a good number of years ago and was so happy to see, you know, your involvement in your website uh, link because I was wondering kind of whatever happened to them. It sounds like they are going strong and healthy. Well, you could look at the screen. This is what's happened to them. Yeah, uh, it's 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 essentially an organization at this point of uh, of of much older individuals, mm -hmm. and has evolved into not simply the recognition uh, by the Catholic by the hierarchical church mm -hmm. of of the legitimacy of the, the married priesthood or a return to the ancient tradition of the first millennium of there being. Uh, married <laughs> clergy serving lo in local churches, as well as uh, as well as celibate, who monastic tradition were basically saying, yeah, sure, but it's evolved into now uh, an opening of the priesthood, not just to males, but also to women, as well as recognizing the legitimacy of uh, of our LGBTQ uh, uh, brothers and sisters that they're all parts mm -hmm. of God's creation. So in a sense, it's evolved to a point where many would find it, quote, too far out. But I think it reflects what, what one day will, you know, will be. And uh, as one of my friends said, it would have been nice for it to have been recognized in, in, in our lifetime, but it's okay to be a footnote to history sometimes. <laughs> how many, does there any idea how many men left the priesthood in the United States in the last couple decades who remained faithful to the church and have been married. I mean, is, is there, is it a minuscule we, number or is it? Yeah, actually, any? actually research masters and doctoral dissertations have been done uh, on, on that in the last say 20, 25 years, um, rather than a specific number. I, I would say about roughly, uh, ten percent of those who left are a little bit strange and weird, like me, uh, who continue to identify as as not only Catholic priests but Roman Catholic priests uh, of the married persuasion, as it existed for the first millennium. About ten percent of us. The rest have left and moved on. That's why my my intention was to remain in ministry. And I was one of those fortunate, blessed people able to remain in ministry because of the work experience, background training that I had. So I always, uh, I always uh, have continued to be involved in, in uh, work in ministry as a a pastoral counselor, pastoral psychotherapist, and um, most of my career was as uh, on the staff of one of these centers that serving the churches, the ecumenical churches, and later even the interfaith churches, as we had clients coming from a variety of other traditions besides Christianity. So uh, I always identify that way. Quick aside, Frank, um, in the uh, in information when I uh, got it back from Bishop Blair as to why I had uh, not been had had my ordination recognized, uh, one of the items that was there was too long removed from ministry, and 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 that totally cracked me up. I mean, all I could do was laugh about it after later on I felt a little bad, but. Uh, be, because I had never, I had intentionally uh, worked to remain in uh, in a recognized ministry, so so much so that when the organization that hired me to run one of their divisions, uh, working with their pastors, um, 
and pretty you know pretty well funded i'm 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 happy to have continued to receive a nice pension from them in the old tradition um the guy who hired me basically said you know who who should i write a thank you note which which bishops which committee uh, in the catholic church he he was the equivalent of a quote protestant bishop in the organization he said i'd like to th thank them very much for uh you know training you so well paying for everything and then make letting you become available to us <laughs> i remember that was very tongue in cheekish on his part but there was there was something to that well uh, let me, Bob, yeah, yeah, the problem what year did you were you laicized i did what I, year I, same i was laicized in 1975. see the problem is I know Bishop Blair had to send your case to Doctrine and Faith. Yeah. And if you had been like there was a guy in the seminary with me from Florida who was younger and he went rogue. He didn't get laicized. Right. But his bishop sent his case to clergy. Yeah. And so that was the first time. But Doctrine and Faith had a file on you already. Right. So you had to go back there. It's only because. O'Malley got my case out of doctrine and faith that it happened. The same thing happened to me. I went to doctrine and faith. They're the ones who were saying no. Right. I was, and at the, the other reason they said, uh, in addition to too long away from ministry, the other one was I was too old. Uh, yeah, well, that yeah. I was, I was 73 at the time. Right. About, uh, about but, but 20 Blair, years. About Blair, Blair and the priests of the diocese in, in Stockton basically had absolutely no problem with that. Yeah. Uh, as you know, they, they just said, uh, based on his past experience, this should really just zip on through. Right. And, and you and I know what happens then. <laughs> I, right. I didn't, I, you know, I, I didn't have a Cardinal O'Malley who could take the, the documents, I, who could uh, talk to the Pope and the Holy Jesus Father, Holy yeah. Pope, right. Because I was, I was 74 when my paper, um, 73, uh -huh. when my papers went to Rome. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Well, and 74, just six years ago this Wednesday, came right. back on my birthday. Right. I, I was long, I was, I, I was in Rome long enough. My, my imagery is my, my initial review by some Italian Monsignor on a Friday afternoon after three glasses of Frascati at lunch uh, with his pasta, just looked at it and, and threw it on the pile of, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the pedophilia cases or something, and that's where it sat. Or, mm -hmm. so and, let, let, me, let me share with you guys a, a, interesting thing that's happening here in Hendersonville is about have you ever heard of the ordinariate of St. Peter? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So two or three years ago, um, <laughs> some of the laity in the parish were approached by a fellow who was a Methodist minister with six kids who lives down the hill in South Carolina from us here that he was very interested in becoming a catholic priest and so and he said um and in fact there is the ordinary it has a bishop somewhere in texas there's houston. one bishop for the whole country houston, houston. Yeah. lopez houston. Is okay name. he's in houston yeah. yeah and um so he name is Joshua. And so Joshua said, I'd like to see if I could get a parish going here. And at that time, um, there was an interest in it because we had lost our Capuchins and we brought in a um, right wing diocesan priest who kind of just unsettled the whole parish. And so there were a lot of people who were looking for another home. Well, the kid's going to be ordained this weekend. Joshua is going to be ordained this weekend, and um, they've spent time coming up with a name, and they've come up with the name Edmund Campion, who I don't know, maybe he was one of the English martyrs or something like that. Um, but it's really kind of an interesting thing because I've learned a lot about it because a couple of my really close Curseal friends are joining that parish, 
and the joining of the parish is quite a commitment because you got to have a core. They have 50 families. There's 50 families that um, have pledged to support this parish. Um, and of the 50 pair of the 50 families, only seven or eight were are Catholic families that all the others were Ang Anglicans, Episcopalians who left that faith tradition because of sexual issues, you know, um, gay clergy and things like that. The rest are all Methodists. And, the, and these are families that have converted and been through RCIA and, and become Catholics. And so it's a very dynamic young group. It's, it's mainly families, which is kind of an unusual thing here in Western North Carolina, where most of us are old farts. You know, it's, it's kind of a, you know, yeah, it's kind of like, it, it looked, our parish looks like this grouping, this group setting. <laughs> We, we talked. We, 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 that's, that's no so comment. That, that was a devastating syllogism. That's that's uh, very very lovingly. Right, the gathering of the old parts. Yeah. It's, it's like the old apostle. So, anyways, the question the questions kind of come up in conversations is, so here's a guy with six kids, you know, and how does he support his family? with a parish of only 50 families. And so part of the deal that's going on is um, how he's got to have a job. And so he's in, so he sells health insurance. So, you know, it's a busy time of the year for him. And so his ordination is coming up at a bad time because this is Medicare enrollment and you know how busy these guys are. And so I'm, I've been thinking about it this week when I got the notice of the ordination, I thought, it cannot be easy, even if you've got a salary paid by the Catholic Church, it cannot be easy to be a family man and to be a pastor. It just, it's, it's, there's got to be just so many difficult issues you'd have to resolve. And I think we're kind of seeing it here with, with Joshua is okay. I mean, he's got a young family, he's got high school and college ahead of him and the Diocese of Charlotte gives no support. They at least give him a church to say mass in. At least they do that part. So I just was curious about what is, it's nice to think mm -hmm. you could go back to the early traditions of married family priests, but is it practical? Is it, I mean, I mean, I know how hard Tom has worked and I know how hard Norm has worked. I know how hard a bunch of other guys have worked and how, how Gary talks about how completely time consuming it is. I can't imagine balancing off the demands of a parish and maybe you've got a school with going home at night and you've got a bunch of kids who are being difficult. I mean, I, I just don't know how you, how we could think we could do that. Kim, it's called tithing. Seriously, it, it's not the cheap Catholic throw a buck in the collection basket. It's, it's a serious commitment to uh, a local church. I learned that <laughs> one of the hats that I wore in, in my working career was as a therapist counselor, uh, working with Christian clergy, their wives and families. And I did that, okay. I did okay. that for 30 years. And I was constantly, this is, a, and I'll take a step back if I may. That was in the old days. A lot has happened in the 10 years, 11, 12 years I've been retired with regard to uh, social developments and non-developments within many of the Protestant denominations, all kinds of interesting. So I don't really know I've been out of the picture other than reading about it. But when I was there up to like 10 years ago, it used to blow me away how consistently uh, pastors coming from mostly the mainline denominations, but also some of the really smaller churches, some of which we hardly hear or even knew existed. And a group of 50 in a, that would have been a good sized group, make a, really? make a commitment to, to their denomination to support 
the pastor, which means to pay him and what he's worth so he can earn a living and, and doesn't have to go out and, um, and be bivocational, though that's always an option in many of the churches and, and, uh, and, the, and the pastor goes along with it because there may, there may not be enough uh, uh, people to support. And so he understands or she, initially, when I was there, mostly he, but it began to be more and more she understood that they would need to have some kind of part-time career. So right from the beginning, as they're looking for a pastor, they're looking for someone who has a career identity as a job to be able to uh, support themselves along with a commitment on the part of the people called tithing. And literally it was a 10th of their income, which they would commit to it. So you're looking at, uh, you're looking at a pretty good uh, budget for that church based on the support of the people. And I would go, boy, are we, including me, I wasn't just talking about Catholics in general, boy, are we cheap when we stop and think about how <laughs> little, how little, but then the flip side of that is, ah, but it also does give control, control to the authorities because the people in the pew uh, aren't really committed. You know, follow the money. If you put a lot of money down, I mean, maybe you want to follow it and, and just see how it's being used and stuff like that. On the other hand, throw 10 bucks in the collection basket, although 10 bucks might be a lot for some people. Uh, you, you don't, you know, I mean, you don't really care about issues related to who runs this place, as in. And I am talking sort of like the old lay investiture movement, which is something we should talk about sometime. That would be a fun conversation to have. Well, Tom or no, Tom or Norm, could could you have imagined being married and having a family and doing what you've done for the last sixty years? No, <laughs> because I have a lot of freedom, like when call in the middle of the night and uh, go to the hospital. I remember I was talking to an Orthodox priest who was married and he and his, 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 he got a call in the middle of the night and his, and his wife said, his wife picked up the phone and says, uh, sorry, he's not here. And he grabbed the phone and said, yes, I am. I'm here. And they wanted him to go to the hospital because uh, there was a lot of resistance. She didn't want him running off to the hospital in the middle of the night. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. So I, I've, I've got a couple, a couple of thoughts on that. One, one of which is, yeah, I can imagine my being married and 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 serving as a priest, as a pastor in a uh, in a parish in a different sort of structure, because I think we you know sort of have to do a lot of the sort of things that. Uh, doctors have to do who have to be on call but they also are able to structure it in a way that there are certain times of being on call and certain times not we have very often held our days off as absolutely sacrosanct and uh, don't nobody bother us and uh, sometimes that's that's a very good thing I think for our health and other times it's maybe not so good for uh, the ministerial demands, some some kind of restructuring of how the demands are made on us, I think would be um, w would would be a key thing, you know. Uh, but the other thing regarding the support, uh, I have been a part in most of my the time of being a pastor in both parishes of the um, National Catholic Stewardship association and you know there is a big emphasis on uh that i don't hear much of them anymore but at that time there certainly was of developing a uh, parish support system based on stewardship uh which did include tithing um that never really fully got off the ground unfortunately i think because of the inertia of of catholic parishes but uh uh i i i i really think that you know there where there would need to be a lot of reorienting a lot of restructuring to um to be able to support a um a a married priesthood and, and let's face it just like they emphasize the 
the married man now who is a deacon that his wife is always a part of that vocation there yeah. definitely has to be uh some kind of discernment i th i think one thing that i think is r rather wise in the eastern church it doesn't always work out that way but that the guy has to be married before he gets ordained which does mean that um there needs to be some kind of evaluation and discernment uh, of the of the real ministry that the wife of a priest would be uh, would, engaged I, in also. Yeah. Are there any in, uh, I'll, I'll put it positively, in, in the Diocese of Oakland, we have at least one formerly Episcopal, now reordained, now that's another whole issue, uh, slap on the face to yes. orders. But uh, functioning, functioning married Catholic priest, he and and uh, he's got uh, half a dozen kids, and uh, no accident that he was also placed like in one of the top five wealthiest parishes in the diocese, and that was of absolute necessity. Well, I know from inside a conversation that his salary compared to the salary of the priest. Uh, uh, celibates uh, identified uh, very quite different, and mm -hmm. uh, no matter how good a spirit that uh, person might be, that creates some hard feelings and a lot of other difficulties. Despite the fact that the bishops, you know, B bishop bent over backwards to explain mm -hmm. that uh, you know his income needs are, are really. Uh, very different and it's an experiment plus plus blah 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 so um last last i heard he was no longer in that parish and was uh, functioning in a more behind the scenes situation and i do believe was also working part-time in, in 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 some other uh setting uh, so but boy would there be a lot of problems i i think actually that what we've been talking about is how to solve the practical problem. Um, you know, to raise children mm -hmm. and to be fair to them and your wife, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm a go slow guy on this. I, you know, I'm not opposed to it if if the the community arrives at that thing. But first of all, the question is is raised in a serious way now because of the sexual abuse crisis which is the worst way to seriously consider something when, when, when sexuality is under, you know, under that kind of strain. Secondly, I don't think, um, I think that it's, um, you know, the, the chatter is that, you know, this is only something that was done in the, in the, in the 1100s to protect the church from um, uh, losing money to priests and their families, et cetera. Um, when in fact there is a celibate tradition and a celibate spirituality that goes way back to the beginning in the early days of the church. It wasn't necessarily universal, but it was there. And thirdly, I think that the practicalities probably are, are to be found, uh, can be resolved in some way, but um, the whole notion of how you, um, maintain a spiritual life that is specific to the priesthood and an intellectual life that prepares you to preach the word of God um, is something that I think doesn't often get addressed. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is that the structure of ministry <laughs> in other churches, while it has similarities to how we do ministry has vast differences as well. So there's, I think, you know, the easy answer today is, well, if we can solve how a priest can raise six kids well, then we're home. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I would very much agree with that, that, you know, it, it's a much broader issue that needs to be addressed in a broader way, including the uh, social, cultural, and very definitely the spiritual, theological, um, pastoral elements. Uh, I've, I've got... Be patient with me for a minute. As you talked, Frank, I got this image 
that in the future, later vocations, widowers and successful business people who are financially stable already might be candidates for priesthood. Right now, I'm guessing those are people who go to the diaconate. Does that make sense? Yeah, but some of them, you know, I mean, I was in a seminary where the average age of the student was 48. So you're right in that there is a field for that. But there is also the sense as that the spirit of God speaks to people in their youth as well. And we have to contend with that and, and till that field. The problem we have now is that we um, have tilled that field almost exclusively and not gone where you're suggesting we should go, John. Um, and I think, so we have to broaden, for example, the whole question, you know, I've, I've been diocesan meetings where they've got up and say, well, of course, one of our goals is to get more young men to come to the priesthood. And the rector of the seminary is sitting next to me and says, hey, wait a minute, we've got a lot of people out there who are potential priests who aren't young anymore, who aren't 24 or 25, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a whole complex, it seems to me. Uh, the, like with corpus, I've never had, I've never been really that interested in corpus because I think that, you know, the first thing we have to get to is how does the church deal with the priests who have left? How do you say on, on, on Monday that this is a special ontological charism that has given that changes you forever? And on Tuesday say, Find your own place to live. You're done. I, you're 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 introducing for me the whole question of how do you what what does clericalism look like versus non the division between cleric and non cleric. I love what Francis is doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Smelling of the sheep. You have you have the perfect ordinary in the cardinal there who who embodies for me uh the smell of the sheep i mean he 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 really does embody that whole tradition that's what it feels like and i've heard him preach and uh and kind of have followed his story over the years your interaction with him uh, but I think what we're wrestling with, and it isn't just in Catholicism, it's, it's across the Christian experience, the whole issue of, of what does clericalism, clericalism look like. My opinion, my impression uh, is, is that we have erred on the side of the separation. Mm -hmm. We have erred on the side of not acknowledging the commonality of the priesthood by way of bat the baptism. Right, where we share that common priesthood of, of Jesus Christ, which embodies priest, prophet, and king. I right. mean, the whole of the same thing. And then what do you do with the ontological issue? Right. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more in, in terms of your interpretation. Well, on the, the ontological issue, because the interpretation of ontology today is that it separates but you can be ontologically affected in order to have you relate. Right. You know, you it's not an isolationist ontology, if you will. Right. It's a relational ontology. I, so I, so, I, so I, that the, the gift is given to you so that you can uh, spread it. Right. So, I, 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 I'm influenced by my background in my pre-med years and study right. of biology, the phylogenetic principle, ontogeny, right. recapitulating right. phylogeny. We, what we need, what, yeah, I remember. You remember? Yeah. You remember? Yeah. You, and, 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 I okay. don't. What is? And 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 and, and, and <laughs> in, in fact, the melding. I mean, there. I think there's something of a clue there. Hey, you know, uh, 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 gratia super naturam subonit. Uh, <laughs> you know, grace does build on nature. Absolutely. And we have lost, we have lost over time and years the connection Absolutely. with nature, with our nature, with our human nature. And that's how we have deviated and gone off. 
Yeah. Well, there's there's a Mel. You know, my, my quick response, I I have I don't have a problem with celibacy. Mm -hmm. I think there'll always be a place and it'll be within the, the yeah, tradition. Yeah, yeah. Within the tradition, and I think it's quote monastic and or religious orders, there'll always be a place there. But as in as in the uh, you know in, in 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 the early church, the whole monastic tradition coexisted along with the, the clerical one, and then one got got to be you know higher and lower. Once again, we're always dealing with those sort of issues. And and also in that sense, the monastic tradition turned into the mil military tradition, turned into the prince, uh, bishop, governor, turned into until such time that they could say, well, we're good, we're we're good with our celibacy. Those guys out there, and I am oversimplifying it. Those guys out there uh, in the parishes need to also be celibate. And then the awful things that happen, as per the. <laughs> the histories to those priests who were married, including it taking quite a while to reach the outer islands uh, so that there continued to be a <clears throat> coexistent, a married priesthood along with the monastic tradition out in, uh, in the Isles of the Hebrides for hundreds of years beyond quote the rule, but that's more history than we probably need at this point. On that note, <laughs> Hey, Crook, how are you? Um, Hi, George. I, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the short story is I have a mass on my liver, but it's not liver cancer. That means it's, a, it's thought to be a cancer that started somewhere else. Uh, and the fact that it's sitting on my liver means it has uh, metastasized already to get there and uh, is uh, malignant, but it's what? not hurting me any, you know? So we're gonna have like a, a qualifying for a fraternity snipe hunt or something with the doctors looking for it. Um, I have no Wait, idea George, back, you, George well, yeah. back up, back up. How, how did you, how did they arrive at the idea to look at your liver? I mean, what? What, what, what oh. was the process you went through on that? I think it was, uh, this is all going very quick, but I think it was when I developed anemia, my old, and, and a concomitant disease, myodysplasia, myelodysplasia, I guess it's pronounced. And so they said, well, that's funny. You know, the guy's had too much iron all his life, and now he's anemic. Um, uh, what are we going to do, Sherlock? And so they started giving me tests. Um, and one test leads to another. I guess it's some sort of addiction they get in that profession. <laughs> hey, hey, George, could you could you adjust your camera? I mean, your uh, thing just a little because we got most I got mostly ceiling. Oh, oh yeah. Time a third of your face. Thank you. You're a handsome, you a handsome fellow. There you are. There you yeah. are. And I don't mean to interrupt your, I, I really am uh, so glad Tim asked, uh, how are you? Because uh, I, I have been thinking. Yeah. What did I know? <laughs> yeah. And this is all new news? Yes, this has all come out in uh, what, uh, the last month? Pretty much, um, but I, we we just figured out. I hadn't think I, I you know this growth on my liver. I had said can't be cancer, can't be cancer, Betty, can't be cancer, doctor, so and so, because my liver function is unimpaired. And if I had an eleven centimeter uh, mass of, of of cancer on my liver, it seems to me it would be impaired. That's as far as my analysis went, you know? And then my wife asked the doctor, well, gee, now, how did it get there? Well, we don't know. Where does it come from? We don't know. Well, but doesn't that mean it's metastasized? Well, yeah. Um, and it's malignant. Yeah. How malignant? Oh, oh it, it we is don't know. malignant. It is huh? malignant. 
the growth on your liver is malignant? Um, I don't know if that is or the cancer from which it has evolved is, which is okay. somewhere else. Oh. Yeah. Is, 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 what do you mean somewhere else? <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, there's an origin. Or right? have they done a PET scan? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because that's usually yeah. the, the diagnostic tool for discovering malignancy. Yeah, that's how they came up with this growth on my liver. Right. But they didn't see anything else anywhere. Right. Hmm. So, 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 okay, do I understand? Ned, Ned you, you, prob you may know because of your son being a... I thought that we were at a point in medical science where they could type a cancer and determine where did it come from? Am I oversimplifying a complicated thing? I don't know. I, thought, I think they can do all that. I just don't know how or how long it takes. Uh, well, to a certain extent, I think it, de it depends on the cancer. Some, yeah, okay. some, have some leave markers, here. you know, like uh, prostate cancer leaves the PSA marker when it is growing. Others don't. Um, whether it's uh, uh, pancreatic cancer is practically invisible until you, you know, have until it's too late. Until it's too late. Um, the uh, oh shoot, I forgot what I was going to say. Hey, so uh, what's the next step? What, what's the next thing you're going to? The be next doing? step is on Monday. I'm having a, a, a biopsy. That's apparently a huge deal. I, I had a liver biopsy. 20 years ago and it was just stick a needle in and listen to George scream, you know, and this <laughs> one they're putting me out for, and the procedure I'll be out like two hours while they're poking around down there. And out of this, out of the biopsy comes, Oh, this originated in the, you know, God forbid pancreas uh, or the lungs or wherever. Um, and, and from the same process, they're able to stage it as I understand it, you know, survivability is, uh, based on, uh, staging, you know, stage, a uh, stage two cancer is one thing, a stage five is something different. Um, but, uh, I would say it's, uh, uh um, you know, it reminds me of Lincoln's story about the guy who told a story about the man ridden out of town on a rail. And somebody in the, in the audience said, well, what was that like? And the guy says, well, <laughs> if it weren't for the honor of the thing, I just as soon have passed it up. And that's kind of how I feel about all this, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> oh, well, now, George, George, you act, you're acting a little detached, emotionally detached from what's going on in your body. Is, is that, am I being accurate in that? Or is this weighing on you emotionally? Probably both. Uh, okay. I, I think, you know, it's a natural, I, I speculate, I don't know. It's a natural tendency to detach one's self from potentially disastrous news here to the organism. You know, well, I don't want to think about that. I'd rather watch um, Yellow, Yellowstone, which I've never seen. But anyway, um, um, sometimes so I think there's a false detachment going on because it, it can't, I, you know. This is potentially a very, very big deal, right? Yeah. And, uh, and here I am, calm and joking around. Nah, that's not real. You know, I think it's real, but it can't really be real. Yeah. Sometimes, George, denial is just a river in Egypt. Yeah. Really, uh, you're, you're, in the, you're in the first stage, sort of like early, uh, you know. I'd be in shock too. I, I remember when I got diagnosed with prostate cancer, uh, you know, 20 years ago. 
and and it was like I I knew a lot about it with my head and my whole body was just trying to figure out and a man was I in 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 like denial as in in shock trying to figure out what the hell does this mean and what are the next steps and what's going on and I'm too young uh, turn 60 and get diagnosed, uh, you know, with cancer. Uh, but because I didn't know squat about prostate cancer at the time. And, and this was happening to me now. Uh, so uh, you, you, you know, it feels perfectly uh, normal where you are right at this point. And, yeah. And um, so, I, I, when I had prostate cancer, I, I, I can almost say I never gave it a second thought. Because the doctor kept saying, okay, we're within the correct timelines and we'll excise this thing and then it won't be there anymore. And we, you know, there's this concept of making sure you get the margins, you know, uh, with it. And uh, so they got it all and it's never reared its ugly head again. But, but so are you Tom? And they did the same thing with me, and you know the margins were intact and all of that, but it it recurred two years ago. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting as people are talking. It's like one of the stats out there is that you know seventy percent of seventy year olds have have prostate cancer, and most don't know it. Eighty percent of eighty year olds have prostate cancer, and most don't know it, and they're not going to die of prostate cancer. Yeah. That it's you know, it's of 90 years old. So interesting to me, Bob, is because, uh, you know, there's this guy that was at Johns Hopkins for decades. I don't know if he's still active, but he was the number one guy in the country, uh, medically speaking. That was and he Walsh, wrote a book. Right? Huh? That was Walsh? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I read the book and uh the, the single most fascinating it's, it's an interesting cancer I, yeah so the, the single most fascinating thing i learned was here is the leading cause of death for males in the first world prostate cancer it takes more of us uh, off the field than anything else does um and so if they get it early you're going to be fine. So, okay. So, but if they get it early and you're going to be fine, does that mean you're going to have a longer life expectancy because you've avoided the number one cause of death for your gender? No, it's got nothing to do with that. You know, you're not going to die a minute older than if, the, if you died of prostate cancer on this bout. And I don't understand that at all. Well, my dad died of prostate cancer, but, he, you know, and he, uh, it was inoperable when he was diagnosed and they, they slowed it down immensely with uh, hormone treatments and that kind of stuff, kept an eye on it, etc. He lived with it for 10 years, but the last five years of his life, it were um, vastly deteriorated. Uh, because of the, uh, um, it it had metastasized to his to the bone, the the spine. But it does, yeah. And he, uh, you know, was uh, severely uh, afflicted with osteoporosis, and it was very painful, continuing to get it, you know, compression fractures and that kind of stuff for probably the last three four years of his life. And then, of course, he at one point had a fall, broke his hip, and uh, two weeks later died of pneumonia in the hospital. So, uh, you know, the, the, the death certificate says pneumonia, but uh, it was caused by prostate cancer. Tom, Tom that had to have been a hard thing for you and your family to go through. Uh, it, it, it was pretty hard. You know, I, I, I was also dealing with my mom in the rest home. My dad had been there. My mom was uh, having, having anger issues at that time, too. I won't go into more details, but, uh, but it, it, it was rather difficult, yeah.
George and Ed, uh, and if yeah. I can backtrack just a minute. When you said, George, that the liver function was not affected, does yeah. that indicate that the cancer is way on the outside of the liver and has not attacked the working part? Ned, I guess. Would you have any insight to that or George? No, no, no. I didn't, but, but I, you know, George uh, continues to explain it as a mass. It, that's how many millimeters? Uh, it's uh, 11 long. So how big is that? How big uh, is it? Four inches. What, what did you say, George? That's uh, pretty big. Wow. Uh, yeah. It's 11, it's 11 centimeters. And then I said, well, how much is that in inches? Oops, four ish. So that's, uh, that's, that's a, a substantial <laughs> mass. Millimeters, how, how, millimeters or centimeters? Centimeters. Centimeters. Yeah, I, I screwed up. Millimeters would be, you know, uh, larger. Yeah. Be yeah. But sure. how, how can something that large migrate from some other source? and then just sit on the liver without, you know, putting roots into it. Yes. Beats me. Maybe it wasn't that large when it migrated. You know, I, I just don't have a clue. I suspect it was a few cells that migrated and probably does have roots into the liver. Unfortunately, you know, the liver kind of the whole liver does all of the functions. Mm -hmm. So it can have uh, uh, tentacles. That's why they call it cancer, the crab, you know? Yeah. Tentacles into the liver and you're, you're still functioning. Uh, in spite of that, foreign intrusion. That's at least my way of thinking about it. I, I'm, I'm not sure that's totally accurate. But Well, but I'm but functioning at the level I'd be functioning at if I didn't have a, yeah. a cancer. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, the liver is a organ. Huh? George, yeah. George, George, can you live, live without all of the liver or is the liver just necessary condition for life? I don't know. It's a vital organ. Uh, it, it's regenerative to some degree. Really? Okay. Yeah. It, it, it'll grow back. But it gets um, so uh, the resilience is, you know, uh, becomes less uh, as we age. Um, sure. So while well, that, that, that makes that, sense, that was one of my uh, real. You know, I'm looking, trying to find positive things here, and one of them was, "Well, get get the shit, the thing out, you know, and and let it grow back, uh, you know, whatever piece for margin's sake uh, you needed to take out." And uh, my son said, "Well, Dad, um, at 80 years old, um, that's not going to be as uh, resilient as you know, 20 year old." Sounds like ageism to me. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to risk well, that answer. Well, just just having had a a prostate cancer procedure on Monday of this week, and being under uh, anesthesia for three hours, I can attest wow. that it takes age. Age is a very big factor in terms of, say, recovering simply from the anesthesia, let alone the assaults on your body, because it's an intrusive procedure. Yeah, I'm amazed that you're here, Frank, uh, given given the fatigue effects of just the anesthesia. I could, I had very mild, uh, you know, conscious sedation with first ed for the eye procedure. And I, I was really tired from the anesthesia for a good part of that for that week. Yeah. Uh, and so, but, and that's age related too. So, right, right, uh, right, right yeah. exactly. It is. But, George, the other thing is that, at least in my memory, it is not uncommon to have something that shows up in the liver to have its origin somewhere else in the body. Mm. That's what they've told me. Right. Well, that's good to hear, I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, but they got to find where it is. Yeah. Where, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they got to find that out is. where that, yeah, what the origin is. Well, jo hey, George, is there anything that we can do? Anything? I mean, I mean, we uh, we don't live near you, so I can't bring meals to you. <laughs> or like that. But but is there anything that, that we could be? How can we be helpful to you in this? I would think prayer. Um, now this 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 collides with a, a big is, issue with me historically. Ned and I have argued about this for years, and. You know, I think a lot of coincidence is attributed to prayer. And, um, and a lot of prayer is attributed to coincidence. Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know that, but maybe. I, I maybe. Do, well, you, you can see what side of the argument I am. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so I, the way I finally resolved, like the first time when, when I had prostate cancer, I don't think I ever prayed to get through it or to recover. And I was going to mass four or five times a week and, you know, um, uh, reading the morning prayer and the, the uh, office of the readings every day. And um, it wasn't that I wasn't a pious little Catholic. It's just I, I still know that I think God's such a traffic cop as that, you know, to micromanage. But now I after that, I sort of I think I would say reasoned. To this result, George, pray, even if you don't much believe in it, because do it out of obedience to Jesus, who told us to pray. Um, so I pray out of obedience to, to the Lord with and, and, very and, little confidence in the results. <laughs> and if you trust in Jesus... No, I just obey him. I don't know if I trust him on this. <laughs> George, you will have purgatory to sort that yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't believe in purgatory. Ned, you get carried away, Ned. Yeah, but, 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 but George, whether or not you believe in it or not has no dip, no basis on whether it exists or not. It, it well, is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> There or not there, but well, you know, that, well, George, got, that that priest, big, big that, that priest that you saved by asking for his blessing, has asked us to send you our blessing. Well, okay, yeah, but so I'll call. happily call, accept Frank. it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You just got. Now, does, does it, you just. Does got anybody me. have any incense they can send to George? <laughs> George, what time is the procedure on? You said Tuesday. No, Monday. What um, time? I think it's seven a.m. West Coast time. Okay. Yeah, all these yeah. things are put at the crack of dawn. You right. Know. And are you having it done at one of the major medical centers? Yeah, it's an imaging uh, place on Cedars uh, Sinai's campus. Cedar Sinai. Yeah, you're at a, at a, a major good place. Yeah. So that's really yeah. good. Okay. Well, know that you are, as my Baptist friends used to say, right at the top of the prayer list. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, and then shortly thereafter, uh, you'll have another. Um, so that's when they're putting in a pacemaker later the same week. Yeah. Has um, the has a bone scan been done yet? Total body bone scan. I don't know. Um, they head did to toe, uh, you, head to toe in, in in the tube. You would know. So uh, probably, well, I was head to toe in a tube. Um, but I don't remember quite what they were doing. I think it was a PET scan, uh, but it went from the brain to at yeah, least pet, the knees. Yeah, PET imaging. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more specifically the bone scan looking for metastases. If that's not been done, I think it probably- I don't think so. Yeah. Um, and it'll be, it'll be, but at any rate, one thing at a time. Yeah. Why? When we, so George, we were talking about 
the dorm that we were in at the beginning of our meeting today, about the 20 of us, nine year, ninth graders. <laughs> you know, when I was thinking as, as you were talking and, and, and I appreciate your sharing this with us. I mean, I think that's part of this friendship group is that we help each other to the degree that we can through the difficult times of being old. Um, and, I, and I always am struck by the fact that when you are in, a, in the ninth grade or you're in college or you're 30 or 40 years old, did I ever think about what it was gonna be like to be 80? You know, I mean, you know, a Norm is shaking his head. I mean, I never thought about it. Never thought about it. Me too. I don't <laughs> never thought. Even think I knew anybody who was eighty. I may have had an ancient aunt or something like that, but you know, this this is an interesting time in our lives. I mean, right. it's just it's 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 fascinating, and I'm trying to figure because Sandra and I both had COVID now for. I'm on my second week and it won't go away. Is, is, is how do we, is there any way that as old men, we can share anything of value to our younger, fully grown adult kids about what it's like when you get to be this age? And, and it, I don't have an answer. It's just something that has been on my mind, you know, for the last couple of weeks with COVID is, okay, the kids went, well, how are you feeling? But I wonder if there's any value in our sharing with them. And, and all my kids are in their fifties, you know, sharing with them, you know, this, this is what we're going through. I, I don't know. I, I, my question may be too open-ended and too stupid sounding, but I mean, Tim, I think I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that sharing that kind of process uh, and and wonderment that, that goes, I mean, there, it's it's a it's a whole new ball game for me. Uh, and uh, I've always felt fit and and uh, able and all that kind of stuff. And I have bouts of depression uh, because my body won't do the things that it used to do. And because I see, you know, a very close friend whom I fought with uh, in my Clemens, for instance, uh, go down. And uh, I see others around uh, uh, us who are about our age, who are in decline, in, in terminal decline. And, uh, and I'm, I'm all these people that you talk with, that you think with, that you, even if you don't really uh, talk all that much, you you know enough about that person that a lot of it sustains you, uh, and a lot of it causes you to 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 rethink uh, and and reconclude and all that kind of stuff. And and I'm sitting here thinking, shit, you know, uh, what am I gonna do? <laughs> you know. When all uh, or many of, of these um, pillars uh, are gone, uh, certainly I think my faith has to be, become much more deep. And, and right. it, uh, you know, these experiences that are, uh, you know, when you're younger, you feel a, a little bit of, I, mean, I felt, felt uh, uh, privileged and all that kind of stuff. That, uh, you know, you begin to question uh, all these saints, uh, Avila, Teresa of Avila, and, and John of the Cross, and, you know, the, the, the desolation uh, that one goes through. Apparently, Teresa of Calcutta was, for the last long time, just always in desolation, and she just had to, to, to believe more. Anyway, it, it, it's a whole new experience, and if, if you can get your kids, I have two sons, and and they're pretty inquisitive, uh, and 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 serious, but I I don't know whether they'll be interested in hearing about how one goes from one passages, you know, uh, one stage. Yeah. Uh, does it matter? My kids are interested. Pardon me. My kids who are the same age are interested. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I mine are in their forties. I. 
I don't think they're so much interested in explaining to them what it means to get old. I think one of the beautiful things about getting old and more vulnerable is that it brings out their caring gene. I agree. In a way that they may not have thought about it. And that can't be anything but good for everyone around them. Good point, Frank. Good yeah, point. Really good. Nicely and that is good. very true. Sorry. You know, let me tell you about a sort of related conversation I had with my brother-in-law. Uh, this a couple of years ago, and I said, Ricky, I've been thinking about dying, just the experience of it. And it seems to me that one thing that'll happen, especially if you have something ongoing like cancer, is that there, there comes a division in reality. Mm -hmm. And you're on one side of it, and you look at the world, and everybody's out there on spring days, you know, on the merry-go-round and singing uh, Ring Around the Rosie and all that. And you, here you are dying of cancer, say, you know, and uh, isn't that isolating and what do you do and all that? So I said, so my reflection on it to date is <clears throat> the way to look at it is, it's a job. You know, it's like if I'm Norman, I've just been sent to this parish, you know, uh, metaphorically, and that's my dying from cancer over a couple of years. Or if I'm me, uh, it's like a brand new case I've taken and I've got to equip myself well and uh, uh, not let down the side, you know, in front of my kids or anything. Um, but it's, it's like an assignment. Okay, George, now you you need to get ready. You need to die. And you need to work your way through it and work your way through it as actively as you can and as filled with faith as you can. Um, and then, uh, you know, you, you uh, and pr you practice giving up because that's what you're supposed to do at the end. And he said, not quite. I don't agree with that. He said, you're close. But he said, what, it, what you, what I, I, you know, Ricky, the bishop would think is that during this period, you're called to hand yourself back to the Lord who created you. Um, like Jesus on the cross where he, he you know, into thy hands, I, I commend, whatever he said, I don't remember exactly. Well, Surrender. But, yeah. Um, and, and that's the process is giving yourself back to God. And I remember Tom's friend, um, uh, well, this is a previous friend, huh, Tom, from years ago, finally got to that stage where she was thrilled to be going home back to her maker. I wouldn't say she was thrilled, but she went from acceptance to submission acceptance to offering let's put it that way uh, yeah. offering of herself right over over her years experience her one year experience of dying with uh, brain cancer and, and that, uh, was, that to me that was very formative because that was in like the third year second or third year that i was a priest yeah. and i just uh, and she was my age yeah, I think I think we all have to be careful that there's a these various stages of of uh, of, of of denial in a sense or of acceptance. Mm -hmm. It's never as clean as it would appear to be mm -hmm. uh, on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, and and that isn't just just you know sort of a, an idea or a thought that I read about something. Boy, I actually experienced that. Uh, particularly in in uh, in the year I spent in the hospice unit of a VA hospital here uh, in Palo Alto, a really large one, and seeing and 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 I had always heard that notion that you know everybody dies the way they lived, and and that what I had experienced as I would learn the stories of these various events, 
and what the dying process, particularly since I was privileged to be there for over a year and observe them. And then since then, uh, continuing to be privileged and honored to accompany people in the dying process as a palliative and hospice chaplain that I continue to, to do, including in the last couple of weeks. You guys are both, you both have lost minds. And so you have that even yeah. more intimate experience you and Frank do with and your that's wives. A, that's, yeah, that, that was a, that was another uh, another experience. And so I'm not sure where I was going with that. That's okay. Thank you, Tim. I'm wondering whether or not um, there isn't a sense where I don't I don't like um, submission or that. I kind of like surrender or giving back. That's why the bishop said yeah. that, that those were his verbs. Yeah, and because I think I, mean, I misused that word submission when I spoke yeah. about it. I think there's a certain sense in which, especially someone who's dying over a long, longer period of time, not someone who dies very quickly, although that could be something to that as well that the Lord comes down the road to meet us and that it's not as if the switch goes off. Um, the image of the father on the porch looking for the prodigal, I mean, the other son was kind of right in a way that according to the tradition of the time, there was absolutely no way that, that one, the prodigal should have been received back. The insult to his family and the family's mm -hmm. legacy was monstrous. Mm -hmm. And yet the father was standing on the porch day after day after day, so that on the day when he came back, he could run down the yard to him. So it seems to me that that image, uh, there's a certain sense of that image, and in mm -hmm. that kind of changes the notion of submission uh, and so, kind of softens it or makes it meeting or encounter or growing towards each other, et cetera, uh, that gives a whole kind of different tone to dying. It's, 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 you triggered this, this thought. It's, it's a process of, of kind of letting go, emptying, but you're not alone because right. as space is made available in the process, God enters, and I use the word God to reflect whatever the person's experience of God. Something, something incredible happens uh, as the person is letting go, oh, and the letting go is most of the time not intended. It just happens, but to see that the space gets filled with, in, in, in the metaphor for me is, is God. God, God's spirit particularly comes in and fills the space. And so that the initial experience gets transformed. And everything that I'm saying is, please God, I hope it's that way for me and for all, <laughs> and for, and for yeah, all, yeah. And for all of you, isn't, and for all of you. It isn't the, the, but the story in a certain of the sense, prodigal, it isn't the story of the prodigal called the little gospel? Uh, and maybe, I don't know. Uh, it's so much more than the prodigal then you know oh yeah well of course it's the father it's, yeah, it's yeah. the prodigal yeah. it ought to be called the prodigal father of course yeah uh, uh, it to be, be called it ought to be called the screwed up family totally <laughs> 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 just so many, so, so many bless the screwed up family. So many dysfunctional families in the yeah, Bible. Yeah. yeah it's, well, you know, Frank, there, 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 it's you, dysfunctional in our time too. It's dysfunctional today. Yeah. There's stories yeah. just like that, and that I see every day. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Of course. Yeah. 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 I, I think for but, me, but, but that 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 is so comforting to me. Because when you when you think about your life, and and to the extent that you were faithful uh, and and acted in faithful ways, you also think about the times when you were unfaithful and acted in unfaithful ways, and and as as you uh, were talking, Frank, 
after all of that monstrous stuff that uh, that the prodigal did, the father hasn't changed one iota. He's he's loving that son as much as he ever loved him, uh, despite all of that stuff. And and it is an encounter. I, I, it's a surrender in that encounter. It seems to me, and 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 that to me is is just. Uh, that's that's also part of what I used to say that what keeps me a Catholic is the cross, the, the crucifixion, and the resurrection, and but the the, the the story of of the prodigal father uh, is, is substantially there to know that that he loves us that much for God's sake, you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, we're 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 all of us just about eighty years old. Mm -hmm. We're on the way. Yep. Yep. We are becoming younger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Frank, and you're the baby of the group. Yeah. 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 Huh? Well, Frank, you are the baby of the group. Oh. <laughs> you are the last one to turn 80. Well, there's a there's a song, isn't there? Such a beautiful baby. <laughs> <laughs> you must have been but darling. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I'm listening. I'm li th this is I don't I and George, you you got us onto this line of conversation, which I think is incredible. But one of the things that play has plagued me forever and ever and ever is what my mother, what I inherited from my mother, which is Irish guilt. You know, and and I have struggled my whole life with perhaps not believing that I could ever be forgiven. You know, and 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 so what? And in I, I do the chaplet of divine mercy every morning, and and I think that eventually it's wearing me down. In that God is love, God is mercy, God is completely forgiving, and that even for Tim, yeah. To be honest, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the the idea of during my life at the end is that and that may be not the best word but is is I'm, I'm not so much now but certainly five or ten years ago I was scared to death of death I, I was scared to death of it because I I'd look back on my life and saying you know no one how, how could anybody forgive me for, for this or that and that kind of thing but I think I'm getting there and, I, and it comes down to trust. Do I trust what Jesus has said? Do I trust in his mercy? Do I trust in his forgiveness? And um, it, it's, just, it's just been a constant with me, which, which I'm probably sharing too much with you guys, but it's... Um, no, I don't see it, why. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it's, really, it's yeah, important. Yeah. So I, I just heard a, a homily by a priest and he said, you know, that mercy and love and forgiveness are sometimes things that we obviously attribute to God and not necessarily. And, and, and the fine point we need to put on that is that God offers his mercy and love and forgiveness to everyone. Yes. But to sit and realize that God offers his mercy and love and forgiveness for me which is the point George was making. He said, for Tim, that's a, that's a crucial, critical thing. It's not, it's not a, uh, a theoretical or an intellectual um, uh, concept um, or even a spiritual, in that sense, concept. It's the real story is that he offered it for everybody, but he offered it for me. Yeah. And yeah. even for the people who've done the most damage to us, like the prodigal son. I mean, yeah. can you think of anyone who can hurt his father more than what he did? Right. And yet he received him with open arms. And that's yeah. that's the God we believe in. And that's kind of cool. I like that. Yeah. And for yeah. that matter, who could hurt his older brother more also? Yeah. 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 You know, he he's he's a tremendously important figure, I think, in that. In the whole story, you know, he, he he offended 
he 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 sinned against everything that the brother the older brother stood to inherit by way of uh, family relationships family identity values yeah, uh, and so on yeah so you know tim i've struggled the same way as you've just described really and, really and, okay and, and it, it it appears to me that we are such a black hole of self Keep race out of this man pardon me keep race out of this <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> no we you know the the gravity of the self is so hard to break away from and and go completely to jesus and and say you are my center you are a, around whom i organize myself and this is what you've told me and i completely you know you're holding on to and my holding on to this guilt and therefore how can anybody forgive is still part of that that self-centeredness uh and when you uh, and I'm, i've struggled all my life to just try to get rid of it you know again lou del castillo used to say i got to get out of the way you know i got to get out of the way um but but when we can finally get out of that gravity of self uh and and uh and look at at him and believe him trust him that's what the the uh chaplet's all about isn't it yeah i trust you yeah see him smiling i'm not, at I'm us. not. see god oh. smiling at us say it again norm to see god as smiling at us ah nice norm just like you are smiling right now Well, and so, and so, idea, Ned, the not believing you could be forgiven kind of thing. That's, I guess, that is really kind of a selfish, self-centered perspective, isn't it? Yes. Well, it's yeah. kind of narcissistic. It's, it's, it's the sin against the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah, I. I don't I don't think so. I think I hope it, you're right. <laughs> I think what it is is it's the it's the negative of the of the photograph that, that <laughs> when one one grapples with it, then the positive is that you come out of the darkness to realize what a great light, like St. Paul said, called out of darkness into his wonderful light. Yeah. So it's you know, is the, it's really a question to ourselves is, could, am I really worthy of being saved? And given our faith, we say, I am, that's, that's incredible. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean I'm this, that, or the other thing. It just means that I'm worthy to be saved. You know, um, last week I said, that I think the bishops should have taken an opening because of the election of people moving away and moving towards, you know, some sense of respect for each other. Uh, listen to what Nancy Pelosi said in her speech. On, you, know, I don't, you know, a lot of people don't like Nancy, but one of the things that she said in her speech on the floor of the house yesterday is, while we have our disagreements on policy, we must remain fully committed, share our fundamental mission to hold strong to our most treasured democratic ideals and then she said to cherish the spark of divinity in each and every one of us wow wow isn't yeah. that interesting yes now, she she, she grasped that opportunity she did she really yeah. did yes yeah. the, if the image as you were talking frank and you, the rest of you inspired me was that do i really believe uh the word of God the Father in the baptism of Jesus when he says, you are my beloved sons in whom I am, with whom I am, in whom I am well pleased. 
you make me smile. You make me happy. Do I really believe that? I know I, re and I say that, I, I wrestle with that. Can, can, I, can I believe that? The spark what was of divinity. What talking about you? What, George? George? Was, uh, whom was, uh, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Was that any, anybody other than Jesus as an individual at that moment at least? Yeah, but donec formato Christus in vobis, you know? It's, uh, it's. Well, uh, that's Nancy. She thinks there's a spark of divinity in each Jesus, and every one of us. Jesus is and alive I, in I, us. I totally believe that. And in line with that, um, I've marked my calendar. And George, I think it's correct. Monday the 21st, 7 a.m. for your yep. surgery. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. I'll send you guys an okay. email. I'm not really sure what the dates are. Well, Monday next is uh, the biopsy. Okay. Yeah. Twenty first. And that's a that's a major medical procedure. For you bet it is. So yeah. my proposal for it. I my think. proposal is that mark your calendars, friends. We're going to storm heaven at 7 a.m. on Monday. On your behalf, George. Amen. Uh, George worth it. it, it uh, I'm, worth in, it. I'm in favor. Is George I'm really there. worth all it. <clears throat> George. <laughs> now let's, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course, George is worth it. So, yeah. so are we? The, to me, the sobering thing. Another thing happened this past week. What's that? Tom? The population of the world reached eight billion. Eight billion. Yeah. Now, all that we have said about God's love for me, you, individually, is also shared with 8 billion people. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some ways that blows my mind too. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, brings me back to that term, how big is your God? Right. Yeah. right. And, and we don't even know if there's other peoples in the universe. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. 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 And how, however many uh, have lived before us. Which universe, Norm? Yeah. And which universe? There you go. There you go. Right now they're talking 16 billion light years out, right? Yeah. 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 I, I, I think it's that I've only known you a short time, George, but I think it's it's uh, our way, the, the, this, this group's way of saying we love you and we'll be with you in spirit. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm not fighting it. Amen, brother. <laughs> this is not George, this is not one of George's cantankerous moments. No, no. There you go. Oh, there you go. Uh, um, George is a, George is a good lawyer. Even if he doesn't necessarily believe in the power of prayer, he's not going to turn it down. Right. Yeah. What the heck? He, 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 oh, yeah. What the heck? Good. What can I lose? What can I lose? <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, uh, Jesus commands it, I yeah. mean, and I believe in him, ergo, you know. Yeah. And so, good enough for Jesus, you. it's good enough for me. The yeah. old, give me that old time old religion. Old fashioned right. religion. Right. 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 All right, there he is, he just, he's calling. Now, George, you're also. A no count brother, anyway. You're, George, you're also getting uh, a pacemaker next week? Yes. And I don't know what the head is even. This is, uh, as somebody, a lot of you guys probably know, when you're in the middle of all this, it's just suddenly it just slips out of your grasp, you know, to yeah. keep track of it. Yeah, um, it's like too much. Uh, I'll send you an email. On, on okay. when the pacemaker is. Yeah, okay. yeah and, 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 you know, this is your first pacemaker, right? You haven't had one. Correct. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. So how many, how many guys have pacemakers? 
Does anyone else in the group have a pacemaker? No, I have, I have stents. <clears throat> okay. stents. Okay. So instead it's, of us bothering you on Tuesday uh, and during the week, uh, George, um, you might be uh, just a suggestion in, in communication, just to keep all the communications uh, down, uh, be in, in touch with Tom or and Tom can forward on to us to make it or easy. Or to Ned, or to make Ned. It, Ned, will you know? Yeah. Make it easy I, for you. I hope to know. Yeah, so seconds after. Yeah, make, make, it, make it Ned, and Ned mm -hmm. can forward it to the rest of us if you sure. would. I'll be happy. Yeah. Okay. Bravo. However, yeah. yeah, just to make it easier for you. And Bob, when is your uh, second cataract surgery? Uh, it's the uh, the last Wednesday in November, the thirtieth. Thirtieth, okay. Yeah. Bob, hey, Bob, it... I was going to ask you. I've had them. Did you? Are you getting new lenses put in your eyes? I, I yeah, they are, and I'm one of the fortunate people be, because I am farsighted naturally. Yeah. Uh, okay. Presbyopic. I can get the very basic, simple lens. Mm. And, and it's totally amazing to me how nice and clear everything is, including I can get pretty darn close and uh, everything is nice and clear. I don't need, I don't need the lenses. And so I, I, I think I'm probably gonna be able to end up post the second surgery with just uh, readers for really close in work you know, over, right. over the I counter. Have, that's what I have. That's, yeah. what you have. that's exactly what yeah. I have too. Yeah. Yeah, both, both eyes got got cataracts taken out and new lenses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when they explained it to me, I thought, oh, geez, do I want them cutting into that eye and pulling out the old and putting yeah, it? Yeah, I would. Oh, I did. I did it. Yeah. <laughs> and then the amazing thing is, I was describing to my daughter who was with me. She said, "Well, what do you see out of it now, Dad?" And I went, "It's it's like uh, before. I didn't realize it, but this eye." I now see that blue is really blue and red is really red and green is really green. And it's it's like the other eye, it's still kind of like looking at an old fashioned sepia toned picture. Uh -huh. Everything's nice and clear and everything else, but the uh -huh. colors are weird. So we're, my brain is still trying to wrap around this. And every I, now and then I get a little frontal headache here. It's like, I have to close my <laughs> eyes. It's, I thought it was a miracle. I thought, wow, you know, I was <laughs> yeah. afraid of this. Amen, <laughs> amen, brother. That's, yes, that's sort of the feeling. I still have one more, but uh, if it's, I basically have the pre-op visit this afternoon uh, and I'm going to tell the surgeon, whatever you did the first time, please do the same. Yeah. Uh, on that note shall we um anybody like to conclude with a prayer and uh you know we we all have our own journey actually i'm going to uh see my new primary care physician uh at one o'clock and i've got a whole list of stuff that i want to talk to her about but uh well what's her name uh, <laughs> Laura Shingleton. She's an Shingleton. osteopath, actually. Oh, that's I got the same thing. I just got my doctor yesterday, my new uh -huh. doctor. And she's Dr. Amador. I said, Well, Amador, she's yeah, that's a lover. That's cool. <laughs> do we all do we all have women primary care docs? Because I do too. I do too. Yes. I, yeah. I, I, I don't do now. I didn't before. I, I became biased having been married to a physician for 30 plus yeah. years. And I, I uh, really appreciate women physicians. And so my intern is, it's fun. Another, another piece is, which was a little more sobering was that she's a high school classmate of my oldest daughter. Oh my God. And, and <laughs> she's, a, she's a superb internist and medical school prof. <laughs> uh, what, it's a small world. Sure is. Are you going to meet? Are you going to meet next week, Tom? Pardon me. Are, are we going to meet next week? Are we going to meet next week? Yeah. yeah. Well, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? Day after Day Thanksgiving. After Thanksgiving I, just, oh, I, oh, I, I, I I vote yes. Are we able to? How many are able to? I can. I can. I can. I can. 
Okay. Let's do it. I, okay. and, and I, I, I'm just been reading a book called Anamkara. Anyone familiar yes, with it? I know that book. By John O'Donnell, who's an yes. Irish mystic. Yes. And he has, he has it's, it's a, a little long, but not terribly long. It's called Be'anacht, oh. uh, which is the Gaelic word for a blessing. Okay. Um, on the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of love gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azure blue come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. Mm. And when the canvas frays in the curragh of thought and a strain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. And may the nourishment of the earth be yours, and may the clarity of light be yours, and may the fluency of the ocean be yours, may the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. Amen. 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 Um, name of the book? Anamkara, A-N-A-M-C-A-R-A, -A -A. John O'Donohue. He's a, he died, unfortunately, in his late 50s a few years ago. He's a, an Irish, he was a priest uh, and a mystic. He, yeah. he um, did his doctoral on Meister Eckhart. Yeah. A-N-O-M? Oh. A-N-A-M, -A Anam. Anam. Kara, C-A-R-A, -A. Oh. separate word. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Did you guys see where the author of How the Irish Saved Civilization died? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Well, I think, Tom, you sent a, 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 a clipping or an article, no? Yeah, I, I guess. Cahill. Cahill. Cahill yeah. Thomas Cahill. Yeah. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> great books. It, it was. It was. It was good. Shall we Thank you on? again for that prayer, Frank. I've got to go. We've got okay. to go. Bye, guys. Oh, no, Happy no. Thanksgiving. Bye-bye. Thanksgiving. Bye -bye. Thanksgiving. Okay. I'm blessed. Bye-bye. See you next Friday. See you all.